Okay, so welcome to this second last tutorial in this video series. So in this in this tutorial, we're going to be talking about the case file or the steering file that you actually use to control the Telemac simulation. Uh, in the next video, the final video, I'll go through actually running the simulation and I'll just talk briefly about some of the output of the, the simulation and how that can be useful for you. Um, so in this, this tutorial, we're going to be looking at uh, the case file. And the case file is organized in such a way that you, you always have these, these keywords. So you have a, a keyword, which is a it's kind of a, a, a noun that Telemac uses, and it recognizes this as being uh, associated with a certain value. So here we have the, the, the keyword title, and then we have an equal sign is equal to this value. So then it knows, okay, when... I need to know what the value of title is. It just looks it up and it knows what it is. The order of these doesn't matter. So you can have any of these kind of just jumbled around. It doesn't matter how they appear in the file. Uh, but for convenience, you probably want to organize them in a way uh, that you can easily, you know, manipulate them and understand how they're related to one another. So I've done that here. I've modified the, the case file that um, was on, that comes with the download. And so when you download the tutorial from, uh, the Telemac website. I've just kind of modified it here. Um, I think it maybe is a little bit clearer. I, I, I just kind of like this layout. So I've, I've organized it like this so that you have the things that you interact with most kind of up at the top and the keywords that you interact with less kind of closer to the bottom. And um, you can just move them around however you feel fit. But uh, they're also kind of loosely organized uh, so that they're related to one another. Uh, which just kind of helps explain things and uh, yeah so basically let's get into it so title this uh, only appears when you actually run the simulation there's a line of code in the printout that says Baxter River tutorial as far as I know that's the only use of this keyword uh, computation continued is a very important keyword so depending on whether or not you want to restart the simulation from a previous file like a previous results file uh, you'd put yes here uh, but if you're running from your initial conditions, uh, so like the, uh, if you're running it from the initial conditions, then you'd put no. Uh, we're running a simulation from very much the initial conditions, so we have no here. But if we wanted to run it from a steady state simulation, say we ran the model for a day or whatever, and we want to restart it with different configuration for different parameters, we could put yes here and then just make a reference to that results file. Uh, this is commented out. Of course, in, in this file, uh, anything that has a front slash in front of it is a comment. So you can, you know, if you remove it, it's no longer commented. If you put it back, then it's commented out. So at the moment, this is commented out. Uh, the number of time steps is the just total number of iterations that will be run. And the time step itself is the kind of the physical delta T between each time step. So five seconds in, in real life. Uh, so if we take 720 times five, we'll end up with 3,600, which is a hour long simulation. Uh, for input output, uh, we have a stage discharge curves file. This is optional. Uh, well, I mean, it's not optional if you want to have a stage discharge curve file, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to absolutely be in the steering file. Uh, it does if you have a one here, which I'll get to in a few seconds, but it's basically just referring to that rating curve uh, that I believe I discussed in another video. Uh, if not, we'll just bring it up here quickly. So the rating curve is in the rating curve file. Uh, this is all related. These are all in relation to uh, the steering file that you're using. So. Um, the steering file is here. So we have a uh, desktop telemac underscore 2D underscore Baxter tutorial files. And then we have telemac underscore simulation files. And this is the file that we're looking at right here. And then in relation to this file's location and on my computer, we're looking at the rating curve and then the rating curve text, which is this file here. So that's how that works. Uh, the geometry file is mandatory. You need to have this in your simulation. Uh, that's the file that you output when you save uh, the geometry, the, the cellophane file here, which contains the bottom and bottom friction values. Uh, so that's a mandatory file. And then again, 
if you look at it in relation to the case file, you can see that it's at the same level within the directory as the case file. So you don't have to have a front slash or you know make reference to any one of these subdirectories. It's at the same level here. And um, yeah, so basically that's how that works. Uh, the steering file, I'm not sure if this is mandatory or not, but it's basically just making reference to this file. Um, I guess maybe you could have it so you have, uh, I'm not entirely sure why this is even here. Uh, maybe if there's a reason, someone could let me know in the comments. Uh, but basically, it's the file that you're, you're using. So Baxter underscore steady underscore state underscore modified dot CS. That's this file. Um, boundary conditions file. We output that from the boundary conditions here. So that's the CLI file. Um, and you just have to make a reference to the that. So the mesh original underscore bc dot CLI. You can see again it's at the same level within the directory, so we don't have to have any front slashes or make references to these subdirectories. And then finally, the results file is the results file that is the name of the file that would be printed out uh, containing the results of the simulation. Um, so we're just going to call this Baxter underscore SS, which stands for steady state, steady state underscore results dot SLF. Uh, so that basically covers everything under this subsection. And if we go into boundary conditions, uh, the first thing that we see here is the keyword for stage discharge curves. So we have zero, zero, and one. Um, as I mentioned uh, in a previous tutorial, if we bring in uh just want to take a look at this so we have these boundary conditions this is our first boundary condition second boundary condition and third boundary condition the first boundary condition is a fixed discharge or so we 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 just specify the amount of flow that's moving through here we specify the amount of flow that's moving through this boundary condition and then downstream we have that discharge curve so zero is just to indicate that there is no stage discharge curve associated with the first boundary uh, likewise there isn't a stage discharge curve associated with the second boundary and finally the third boundary which is this boundary so one two three and then the convention again is starting from the lower leftmost point moving along these boundary nodes the first boundary that you hit that's the first boundary this would be the second boundary and then the third boundary so just following that convention uh you know this is the the uh the boundary that has the stage discharge curve um, so that basically sums up this line uh the second line is the uh, this next line is velocity profiles um, so five, five, and one. So again, we have a five coming in here, a five in there, and a one out there. You're probably wondering what that means. If you go into into the uh, Telemac 2D user manual, you can put in velocity profiles, velocity profiles, and maybe it's just velocity profile. Next, 22. Uh, okay, here it is. Okay, so prescribing velocity profiles. So this is on page 35 of the Telemac, uh, the Telemac manual. And you can see here you have the an explanation for each of these codes. Um, so basically, five is just the, the velocity vector is normal to the boundary, and its magnitude is proportional to the square root of the virtual water depth. Um, so my interpretation of this, and please correct me if maybe you know more in the in the comments about this, is that it is basically trying to attempt to to impose somewhat of a velocity profile so closer to the banks you have less velocity uh, which is normal and then in the deeper parts of the flow you have a higher velocity so that helps approximate more of a natural uh, inlet condition uh, one uh, on the other hand is just a velocity vector is normal to the boundary with no attempt to correct the so you can see here in the description in the case of a prescribed velocity, the value used in the velocity is provided. Uh, in any case, sorry, in any case, the velocity profile is constant along the boundary. So it doesn't make an attempt to actually change the the velocity depending on how close it is to <coughs> the boundaries or how deep the flow actually is. It's just imposing the same velocity everywhere. So that can have some pretty important consequences on your simulation, and just keep that in mind. You can 
you know, feel free to have a look at the different boundary conditions and choose one that's appropriate for your simulation. I just wanted to point out that that's what they mean, and you can find uh, the descriptions of those in the Telemac tutorial manual, or the Telemac manual, sorry. And then this next line is prescribed flow rates. So we're looking at 570. That's for the Baxter branch here. We have 11.5 for the Thule branch. And then downstream, we don't have a prescribed velocity, but we do uh, put zero here as just a placeholder uh, to let, well, it, there just isn't a prescribed velocity there. So when it's zero, it just says there is no prescribed velocity there. The prescribed elevations, again, it's zero, zero here because we have prescribed discharges coming in. Whereas downstream for the, I believe this is for the first iteration, we have a prescribed elevation of 15, but following that, it's going to use the stage discharge curve to determine what that fixed elevation is at the downstream end. Uh, but I believe this is just for the first iteration. And then following that, it will, um, yeah, it will use that stage discharge curve to determine the elevation. Uh, the next section here is uh, friction coefficients. So, um, in the other video, in, in, a, in a previous video, I talked about how to bring in a bottom friction value. Uh, so these these values are actually, this value here is actually overwritten uh, by whatever is present within the, uh, within the, um, the geometry file. Uh, and the law of bottom friction is four. So if you look at, if you look in the manual again, bottom, friction, you'll find that there's a number of different values. Four is associated with Manning's law. <clears throat> so that's the Manning's roughness coefficient. So as I said, this is just here as kind of a placeholder at the beginning of the simulation. Uh, law of bottom friction needs a friction coefficient. If you try to run this with this commented out, it will crash on you. Uh, so it needs to be there, but just know that it's going to override those values with the values that you've imposed uh, in the, um, the geometry file. Uh, and then moving into initial conditions, so we have a, an initial condition of a constant elevation everywhere, and that constant elevation is equal to 20. There's one very important point about this, uh, is that when you try to run a simulation, uh, and, you know, for whatever reason, if, uh, this is the one I want to see, I'll just, yeah, okay, so th this is the mesh colored by elevation. So, <clears throat> you know, if you're running a simulation, and for some reason you have a bunch of dry nodes close to a boundary, your your simulation is just going to crash. It's not going to work. So what you need to do is uh, just click on the nodes that are very close to it, the boundary, and you'll see, okay, the elevation at this point is 15.69. Uh, so just keep that in mind and then go here and then click on this boundary. And I believe it's like 19 point something. Uh, okay, 19.14 meters. So what you need to do is, is specify an initial elevation that's going to drown those nodes. So they need to be underwater, otherwise your simulation is going to crash. So if you had a, a uh, an initial elevation here of 15 instead of 20, uh, your simulation would crash because um, it just doesn't know what to do with the water that's coming in and it just crashes. I, I couldn't tell you the exact specific reason, but if you drown this, it, it will, you know, your simulation is going to run. So just Try to choose something that's a little bit higher um, than, well, than the uh, the bed elevation. You could even put this to 21 or 22. But the thing is, like, if you fill this up even a lot more, you're just adding more volume of water to your domain. And if you have a large domain, it could take a long time for your simulation to reach steady state. So you just know that, like, you just kind of have to play around with it, but you have to make sure that you don't have dry nodes near your boundaries. Um, just keep that in mind. It's it's very important. Uh, and then finally, getting into graphics and listening. So information about solver. Uh, when you run the solver, and I'll, I'll be going through this uh, in the next video, but uh, basically information about the solver is all this printout here. So when you run the simulation, you get all this data, all this this printout so you can see what's going on in the simulation as it's progressing. So that's what that is. <clears throat> Information about solver, yes. Listing printout period is 100. Uh, within the uh, within the printout here, you can see that you have an iteration, 1,000. So it starts at zero. There's no, there's no data. 
and then at iteration 1000 you have a printout then at iteration 200 you have a printout uh, so that basically tells you how often does Telemac output that to the council so that you can see what's going on within the, the model. Likewise, graphic printout period is the time period that the results are output to file. Uh, so those are the results that are output to file. So if you had this at one second, it would print out the results every one second. If you had it at 100 seconds, it's printing out results every 100 seconds. So depending on you know the level of time resolution that you want to look at you can play around with this and you can have an incredibly fine detail in time or you can just have a few time steps because maybe it's a steady state stimulation that you just want to use as a restart you don't really care about having a large file um, you know you, you can play around with this to try to basically limit your file size to make sure you're not getting too much information that is is useless to you so just know that that's what that is and then finally, uh, variables for graphic printouts. Um, so this is very module dependent with Telemac, uh, you know, the Telemac suite of solvers. But of course, U and V are uh, the streamwise and lateral velocities. Uh, S, so these are very common to pretty much everything that is a hydrodynamic model uh, in Telemac. So you're going to have your streamwise and lateral velocity component. Uh, if it's a 2D simulation, I've never run a 3D simulation, but maybe you can also get out W, which would be your your vertical velocity. Uh, S stands for the um, surface elevation, so that's the elevation of the surface. The B is the bottom elevation. H is the depth, um, and F is the fruit number, and L is for the current number. Uh, there's also a lot of other <coughs> uh, keywords that are more specific to actually you know, the code that's solving the equations. Uh, I won't go into details about this. Yeah, I wouldn't be able necessarily to give a very good description without doing a lot more research on each of these. But just so you know, these are also, most of them are mandatory for your simulation. Uh, you can have a look at these. They're fairly well described in the Telemac manual. Um, so I just would direct you towards the Telemac manual if you have any um, if you have any questions regarding these these uh, these parameters, uh, so basically that's everything that I wanted to say about the steering file. In the next video, I'll just run it and I'll go through the graphic printout just so you know, or sorry, the listing printout, uh, just so you have a better idea of what is actually occurring when you're running a simulation. Uh, so just hope hope you're there for that next video and uh, i hope that you're finding these interesting and useful if you have suggestions for other videos just mention them in the comments but uh, if not i'll see you in the next one